for that. Last Sunday morning, we began a verse-by-verse study through the book of Numbers. If you'd make your way to the book of Numbers, not that you're going to particularly need it this morning. You'll understand better in just a moment. But the book of Numbers is the fourth book in the Bible, the fourth book of the the Pentateuch, of uh, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And We began a verse-by-verse study last week with just an introduction. The book of Numbers is narrative in style. That is, it gives the details of the 40-year history of Israel wandering in the wilderness after leaving Egypt. Last Sunday morning, in the introductory message, I closed that message with 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 13, which is what the Apostle Paul, 1,500 or so years later, wrote about some of the events that took place in the book of Numbers. And Paul told the Corinthian church, now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they're written for our admonition, that is our teaching, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Paul believed that the Lord would return even during his lifetime. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Oh, what a reminder for me. What a reminder for all of us. Folks, we are a biblically literate church. One of the first things Kathy noticed uh, when uh, she, she and I got married seven years ago next month, and she came to Kansas City, moved here from Philadelphia, came into this church, and within a month she said, Vic, the young people here, the children, know more Bible than I know. They have more memorized. We are a biblically literate church, and we are, and that's wonderful, and that's, that's great. Grand and glorious, and it ought to be that way. Uh, from biblically literate homes and parents who train young people, but we dare not imagine that we think ever that we're standing just fine in our own knowledge, our experience, our faithfulness in giving. Lord, it is all about Him, not about me standing strong, because I will fall in a minute. I'll be tumbled over by the next temptation because the, the, uh, the uh, uh, arm of strength, arm of flesh, will fail you. You dare not trust your own. And so, let him who thinks he stands, be careful, you're going to fall, because there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. What went on during the time of the writing of Numbers is still going on then, in first century AD, and it's still going on now. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able. He's not going to put you in, a, uh, in an impossible situation as a believer, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. Could be death. He might just take you on home so that you'll be able to bear it. And so these verses tell us that God used human authors in the past to record what took place so that we might learn from it. In short, the Bible is written from God, and it is to and for us. Now, with that as a little bit of a backdrop, I'm going to scare you. I'm going to startle you because the book of Numbers is 36 chapters, some of those chapters quite long. We're going to look today at Numbers 1, 1a. (laughs) We're going to look at the first phrase of the first verse of the first chapter of the book of Numbers, And as you can see, it says, and the Lord spoke unto Moses. Now, I believe I can solemnly vow, even vow, uh, uh, beyond a promise, that we will take more than phrases week by week in our study through the book of Numbers. There will be sometimes we'll take chapters, I'm sure. But today, I want to focus on The God-breathed word. The title of the message, The God-breathed word. It's the chief weapon, arguably, uh, the sword of the Spirit, uh, to be in the world and not of the world, which is our theme this year as a church. If I'm going to be in the world yet not of the world, I have to be armed for conflict. And 
The armament, part of the armament God has given is the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, the Word of God. And the Lord spoke unto Moses. First of all, what does that mean? What is the meaning of inspiration? What does that mean when we say the Bible is inspired, the meaning of inspiration? Well, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, probably uh, the most familiar of uh, text with this subject. It says that from a child, um, Paul told Timothy, young Timothy even, maybe as, uh, still in his 20s, uh, possibly into his 30s, from a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures, that is the written Word of God, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is mature, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Scripture came into being because God breathed it in a similar way that he did the universe. God spoke and the universe came into being. So too, he breathed into existence the Word of God. It is a supernatural book. Now, what is it then that is inspired or God-breathed? We who are Bible believers are convinced, and uh, the church throughout the ages have been convinced that the very words of Scripture are inspired. Inspiration is the breathing out of God's Word. Uh, it's what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 4.4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Folks, we believe in, this is worthy of taking notes, you've heard this before, we believe in the plenary, P-L-E-N-A-R-Y, comma, verbal, V-E-R-B-A-L, inspiration of Scripture. Now, taking that in reverse order, the inspiration is that God breathed it out. The uh, verbal uh, is that, uh, or, or, uh, yeah, the verbal, that is, the very words themselves, and plenary in that it's the totality of it, it's the entire Bible from Genesis through Revelation, the very words, not just the thoughts or the concepts. Well, uh, this was uh, for that day and age, uh, uh, and the, the general concept is this. No, the actual words themselves were inspired and given through the human author, uh, the one who actually penned it. So in this case, we see in verse 1a that the Lord spoke unto Moses. We hold to the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. Now, a thought on that uh, so that you, you're sure uh, that uh, uh, you understand, and this is important. <clears throat> MacArthur wrote, it's important to note that inspiration applies only to the original autographs of Scripture, not the Bible writers. There are not any inspired Scripture writers, only inspired Scripture which is why as a local church we stand strong and have stood strong for a quarter of a century against the wave in our geographical location of folks who have said time and time and time again and still to this day say, God spoke to me. He, uh, uh, he impressed my heart. He told me to go from point A uh, to point B, and, and that's the word of the Lord. And I have a prophecy, and I have a word of knowledge, and all the rest. No, there are not inspired people. There are only inspired words. And if you are saying that that is what happened, then you are putting what your experience at an equal level with what the written word of God says. We reject that. We just flat reject that. This is the written word of God. The canon is closed. There is not any new revelation. We hold to Genesis through the book of Revelation as the inspired canon of Scripture. Uh, it is my duty, it is my calling to warn us against that other type of tomfoolery. Um, MacArthur wrote, <clears throat> he qualified it, that uh, it's important to note that in the original autographs are inspired. How many original autographs do we have? 
Say it again real loud. We have none of the original Hebrew of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament. Actual, uh, we don't have the parchment with the ink that Paul wrote to the Romans and to the Corinthians. Is that what you're telling me? You're not sure, are you? Are any of you absolutely sure? Hold your hand up if you're absolutely sure that we do not have any of those autographs. I join you in that group. When I first learned that, uh, after I'd been a believer for a few years, it rattled me to the max. What? We don't actually have somewhere in the British Museum or somewhere in Jerusalem or or in Tel Aviv or in Cairo or uh, somewhere, there must be the document, the actual document itself upon which Paul wrote or Peter or whoever it might be, David with the Psalms. Nope, not a one of them. Now, to be sure, we have tens of thousands of fragments of copies of those documents Uh, more than any writing of antiquity, it dwarfs all of the other writings added up together, how much we have of Scripture, but not one original. Does God have the power and wisdom to be able to have preserved any or all of the original strokes of the pen? Could God have done that? Can we conclude he chose not to do that? Hmm, got a problem here. I'm in a conundrum. We say that the words are verbally plenary inspired, that God breathed it, yet we don't have the originals. Why? God in his wisdom said, one, if you actually have the document upon which Moses wrote, what does that document become? And it's an idol. Instantly, it's going to be an idol. It's going to be an idol throughout all the ages. God said, I'm not going to have That will be tempting you beyond what you're able So, that was one reason. Also, if you have one document, what could happen to that one document? Destroyed, lost, burned up in a fire. Nothing uh, unusual about that sort of a thing. He says, I'm not going to allow that to happen. If you only have one document, what else could happen to it by way of man? It could be corrupted. I'm not going to have that. So, what the Lord did in his wisdom and his kindness toward us is that he had tens of thousands of copies done that we, where we do have those fragments that we can apply the science of, Brother Paul, textual criticism. A linguist. You concur with me on this, don't you? Oh, good. <laughs> I didn't run this by him first. <laughs> He's a professional linguist. I am not. I just talk a lot. <laughs> Walking into a room mouth first. And so, because of textual criticism, comparing all of those tens of thousands of documents, we come away with absolute certainty. There is, this is the Word of God. And so, what God gave to Moses in the book of Numbers, the God-breathed Word, we have utter assurance that it is exactly as God intended And he made sure that we couldn't corrupt it, that it wouldn't be destroyed, and that we wouldn't worship it by doing away with the originals. If I was a charismatic, I'd say, let's give God a hand on that. I'm I'm, I'm being playful now. I'm not being mean. At least I don't believe I am. But I was telling Kat this morning, I'm not very politically correct, so maybe I am. Who knows? God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. We have the inspired word. Secondly, what was the means of transmission? How did God actually give the inspired word? How did it come out? What was the mode? How was it delivered to and through Moses and the original Writers. Well, we know, we can conclude, it wasn't through dictation. Because if it was through dictation, uh, there would not be variables in style and language and, uh, and the like from one writer to another. Which is why I'm convinced the Apostle Paul did not write the book of Hebrews. Because if you read through the Pauline epistles, uh, starting with Romans, uh, going all the way up until the time of 
Hebrews, and then you open up Hebrews, and you say, oh, that's a brick wall. That doesn't sound anything like Paul. To me, it doesn't. And so, it wasn't by dictation because of the various styles. Some scriptures seem to have come about by what Erwin Lutzer calls ordinary means, like Luke, the Gospel of, like, uh, Gospel of Luke uh, and, the, and uh, the book of Acts, also written by Dr. Luke. And it says in the, uh, in the prologue, in the opening verses of those two books, that I am recording a, a historical document of the things that I've seen, I've researched, I've heard, uh, I've talked to others. So ordinary means, of course, it was earthly instruction and earthly investigation with heavenly inspiration because the Spirit of God carried them along the, God, the, uh, the writers of Scripture. Another common means uh, dealt with the personal and immediate circumstances of the writer. That's exactly what we have in the book of Numbers. Moses said time and time again, or he wrote time and time again, the Lord spoke unto me. He did it uh, not in the first person. He said the Lord spoke unto Moses, gives it a, a, a detached feeling, uh, but we know that he in fact was the writer. So the personal and immediate situation, um, but how did, how did it actually happen? I mean, he, could, he didn't call him, he didn't text him, um, or the like. Um, I, I once heard, uh, knew of a, uh, a little one, uh, a four-year-old, whose uh, grandparent went home to be uh, with the Lord, and, uh, and that four-year-old uh, called, uh, ask, uh, ask somebody, does this grandparent have a cell phone in heaven? And it was a three or four-year-old. And the child didn't think so, but wanted to just make sure in case we could text. And that, that, was, that, was, so, that, was, that was so precious uh, to, uh, to, to see the inside the heart of a, a little one about those in heaven. And God didn't do it that way. And he didn't write it in the sky. And he didn't send a, 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 a messenger pigeon, you know, with a note. Or How did he actually communicate it? What was the mode of transmission? Dennis Cole, commentator, wrote, Precisely how this divine disclosure between the eternal God and his servant Moses transpired remains a mystery. But however this communication was accomplished, whether by audible human speech form, mental and spiritual impression and compulsion, or by intellectual impregnation of ideas, the prophet Moses became the instrument for divine illumination of humankind, of the will and the word of God. In other words, God superintended the writing. So it's both a divine book. It comes from God. God breathed. And it was transmitted through a particular human author. Now, that is not an unprecedented concept. Is Jesus God? Is Jesus the eternal God? One more time. Is the Lord Jesus Christ the eternal God of infinity? Yes. Is Jesus 100% human? Yes. So you have the God-man. You have God and man in one. Well, with Scripture, you have God and man coming together, as it were, as the Spirit of God carried along uh, the, uh, uh, the writers uh, to record what he wanted. Maybe, maybe not a, a, a perfect uh, illustration, uh, but you get the idea of how uh, the heavenly and the human su- element uh, will work together. <clears throat> the actual transmission uh, took place by direct communication. Moses on Mount Sinai when the Ten Commandments were given. And, and so we see any number of means uh, and methods and modes by which the communication took place. Jesus said, I'm not come to destroy the law of the prophets. Uh, this is why it's so important. Last week I told you, it is, in, is it important that we know that Moses wrote? Yes, because Jesus alluded to it. And I'll share at the end um, uh, another example of where he uh, alluded to Moses being the author. He didn't come to destroy. He came to fulfill. 
Heaven and earth uh, will not uh, pass away. Heaven and earth will pass, but one jot, one tittle shall no wise pass in the law till all is fulfilled. So, the method of transmission. And then finally, the ministry of transformation. What happens with the God-breathed Word? Well, folks, it changes our lives is what happens. Amen? You were born again, according to 2 Peter, not of corruptible seed, 2 Peter or 1 Peter, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the Word of God. You heard the gospel. Someone shared the scripture with you uh, that uh, you are dead in trespasses and sins and that you can be made alive uh, and forgiven and a child of God if you will call upon him. That's all scripture. And so the transformation that takes place from the God-breathed word is salvation, <clears throat> is Christian growth, uh, it's any number of things. Now, if you'll notice in our, in our text, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, just in the book of Numbers, 36 chapters, in three of the chapters, chapters 22 to 24, that phrase is not used. So in 33 chapters, that phrase, or almost an uh, identical uh, phrase, occurs 80 times. So an average of two to three times per chapter. It says, it actually says, God spoke to Moses. And we, who are Bible believers, believe that he wrote it down just as God had said it. He came through that human agency. Warren Wiersbe <clears throat> noted that over 150 times in the book of Numbers, it's recorded that God spoke to Moses and gave him instructions to share with the people. In other words, there was another 70 times where the text is clear that the Lord was communicating something to Moses and maybe used a different way of saying it, but other than, and the Lord spoke unto Moses. So 150 times, just in the book of Numbers, taking out the three chapters that that's not recorded, that means that nearly five times every chapter, it is stated, it is inferred, it, or implied, that God is the one who is leading Moses and telling him to write this down every step of the way. Folks, we can have the assurance that the book of Numbers is just as important in the mind of God as the book of Genesis, as the book of Psalms, as the book of Romans, as the book of Revelation. It's God-breathed word that we're going to be studying in the book of Numbers. It transforms lives. Ronald Allen <clears throat> wrote about the verse we read earlier, 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. He, he, he centered on verse 16. All Scripture is God-breathed. Rarely are these grand words taken beyond their bare statement of inspiration. They're used merely as a proof text for the divine origin of the Bible, not an inconsiderable issue. In other words, that itself has great weight. But these words are not the principal assertion of Paul in this well-known passage. They are the assumption. We, we, in other words, Paul is saying, you already know this, Timothy. You already know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of, Paul, uh, of, of God. Paul argues that since Timothy knows that the Scriptures are the outbreathing of God himself, therefore he and we should regard them as eminently worthwhile. The holy scriptures that have the ability to make one wise to salvation and that are the outbreathing of God are profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Indeed, they're the means for the full equipping of the Christian for every good work of God. Now, I want you to think about this, this comment about 2 Timothy 3, which says all scripture is given by inspiration of God uh, and it will transform your life. Most of the New Testament, check that, a large portion of the New Testament had not yet been written, and that which had been written hardly was disseminated around the known world yet. So what scripture is Paul referencing when he wrote to Timothy here and told him that the scripture is profitable to transform your life? What scripture is he talking about? The Old Testament. He's almost exclusively talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the book of Numbers. 
is what he's saying. Because the Lord spoke unto Moses. And God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the same gospel of the grace of God in Christ is found in Numbers. Oh, not explained to the fullest degree like it is in Romans as the communication of Scripture grows and grows and grows throughout time, but it is the same Word of God. Allen concludes, when one discovers the significance of the book of Numbers as a credible unit in the unfolding of the whole of Scripture, then its material becomes essential to building a biblical theology. In other words, the book of Numbers will help us be in the world as Israel was when they were in the wilderness and when they were in Egypt and then when they'd later go into Canaan to be in the world, but not to be of the world. The Lord spoke unto Moses. And he spoke unto Moses also in chapter 21 and verse 9, where Jesus referenced, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now, setting aside the deity of Christ for a moment and just focusing on his humanity, how did Jesus know that Moses wrote as the serpent was in the wil- lifted high in the wilderness, so too shall the Son of Man be lifted? How did he know? He knew the book of Numbers. Y'all following that? Jesus is in the book of Numbers. And if Moses didn't write the book of Numbers, as liberal theologians will say and contend, then Jesus was clueless about what he said in John 3, the chapter that says, for God so loved the world that he gave. And as Moses was lifted up, uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so too I will be lifted up. Jesus affirmed the inspiration of Scripture and the human authorship of Moses with the book of Numbers. Wow! We're entering into God-breathed text in these coming months in the book of Numbers so that we can be equipped to be in the world while not of the world. To God be the glory. Lord, I'm thankful for your word and the inspiration, the transmission, and the power to transform our lives. Bless us to our hearts. And as we observe the table, the Lord's table, we're called to do this in remembrance of Him. May we do so, reflecting on what you've done for us, thanking you, praising you, serving you, obeying you, revering you, all our days for you are worthy.